so that we can use this for replay and for, for folks who miss it. A lot of people said, hey, late notice lady, um, I couldn't get this in my schedule. I have a standing meeting. Um, so I was like, that's all right, I'll record it and we'll make sure you get the recording out. So welcome everybody, my name is Rebecca Ryan. Um, today's webinar is on storytelling, story making, and how it designs our futures, how stories design our futures. Now, just a couple of quick Zoom announcements. Um, at the in the upper right hand corner of your zoom screen there's a speaker view or a gallery view so if you like to see my head big put it on speaker view um, i think that'll be especially useful when i share some slides but if you like the brady bunch effect the hollywood squares effect keep it on gallery view and uh, that works as well um, and if you prefer to not have your camera on that's cool if you want to keep your camera on we love seeing you it's one of the ways that we can we can feel socially connected i hate social distancing it's we need to be socially connected it's physical distancing that we're doing so um it's wonderful to be here with you so um quick show of hands for those of you who are on cameras just put your hand up in the air if you actually did the previewing and you watched so high's cla tedx talk Ooh, here are my type A's right there. Um, and how many of my campers remember CLA from camp? All right, a couple of campers remember CLA from camp. Oh my God, Teresa comes out with her camp workbook. Um, all right, Coleman, you show off. She, I'm telling you, she's straight A's in camp, straight A's. Um, okay, so um, this is a like all futurists, uh, when they name things, they give them these clunky ass names. This is causal layered analysis. And um, it is a clunky name, but it is, I was gonna say it's a really sexy tool that might be overselling it just a little bit. I really like this tool. We'll, we'll talk about why in just a moment. But I wanna back up and start with this. If we want better futures, we gotta have better stories. And you know, I've been on a tear since about mid-March talking about one of the likely things that will happen as a result of COVID and its related economic recession is a giant urge to snap back, to have things go back to the way it was. And as many of you heard when we had uh, my teacher, Peter Bishop on last month, um, snapping back is exactly what happened after the Great Recession. You know, despite too big to fail, despite millions and billions and trillions of dollars, um, we snapped back to the way it was. Banks are bigger now than they were before. Um, the economic divides that were present previously have widened. The achievement gaps that we were starting to talk about before the Great Recession, many other cities have re recognized that they have their own achievement gaps. So, man, hand to God, you guys, I do not want us to come back from COVID and snap back to the way it was, because the way it was was broken for a lot of people, right? And Democrats, Republicans, broken for rich, broken for poor, um, broken for um, young, broken for older. So we've got to do better than just bounce back, snap back to what was. So this has been my tear. This has been my imploration. Um, last week in my newsletter, I said that my prayer was that COVID could change us, that COVID would change us, that we would allow COVID to change us. And it remains my prayer, right? And I think for many of us at a very personal level, some of us are having an existential crisis right now, right? We're thinking like, how does what I do matter? Uh, what is the purpose of what I'm doing? Some people have told me um, as they're going through their unemployment and their layoff and their furlough, like, you know, I wasn't even sure I wanted to do this in the first place. So moments like this can have a very um, purifying, a very clarifying effect if we let it. And that usually requires facing into some fear and facing into some questions. And it's one of the reasons I love foresight tools because they give us a structure, um, a pathway from the chaos of the moment to try to just shine the light on what could happen, what might happen. So let's take this journey together. Um, I'm gonna share my screen with you 
And I want to show, um, for those of you who have been very used to the pink images of our brand, this is going to look a little bit different. I've been working with our graphic designer, um, Dave, on this. And we're, we're coming up with some new imagery, some softer imagery, and some imagery, frankly, that I think is going to work well in a desktop environment. Because I think, I know for myself, I don't expect to be at any national meetings for the next 12 months. I just don't think the national meetings business is going to bounce back to, to where it was with the set of assumptions I'm making about the future. But um, Dave and I, my graphic designer and I, have been playing around with some of these concepts around foresight and how we can graphically illustrate them. And um, we think about things like COVID as a drop of ink on paper. You know, it is a moment. It is something that is absolutely happening. It is true. It is real. You can, you can see it. You can experience it, right? But as you think about how we move through this, right, um, there are a lot of different ways this could go. So if COVID is that drop of ink on paper, right, and then it spreads, it spreads like ink spreads through the weave of, of the paper, right? And it spreads and it fans out in different ways. And you might even look at this image and think, wow, that almost seems a little bit scary because of how it's spiky and jaggy. And certainly, you know, that is how it feels. And then we try to mitigate, right, with some economic um, sort of uh, shoring up. So we try to mitigate the healthcare spread. And then it creates additional spread, right? It creates economic spread. And we see this ink just move further and further um, across the page. And the, if, if the ink itself wasn't enough, right, the spread of the health pandemic, the spread of the economic crisis, then you've got this tasteless, senseless, almost invisible uncertainty, this fear. And I've been watching this very carefully in myself. I'm sure you've been watching it in yourself. Um, I kind of hit some black ice last week for the first time where I started in, in the upper Midwest, that's a thing, right? <laughs> where there are these slippery spots on the road that you can't see. They look like the exact same color as the black pavement, but you hit one and all of a sudden you fishtail or your car slides. And uh, I hit a piece of black ice last week, uh, just kind of mentally thinking through the impact that this was gonna have on our clients the impact that this was going to have on my business. Um, and it, you know, I lost my bearings for a little bit. And it's that you can't even put your finger on it, right? It's that, it's that uncertainty. It's that sense of not knowing. You know, we as humans love the myth of certainty, but it is a myth, right? It's nothing is truly certain. And you know that if you've ever gotten a call from a doctor or a call from a loved one, uh, with some bad news. Nothing really is for certain, but all of that uncertainty is just screaming at us right now with such speed and with such volume. So sometimes we, we slip, right? And sometimes we kind of lose our place. So this uncertainty is very far reaching. People experience it at different times. Um, a friend of a couple of ours uh, who are married, a couple friend of ours who are married in their wedding vows, one of their wedding vows was, I promise to never freak out at the exact same time as you. And uh, I pray that you have that person in your life, you know, that when I'm freaked out, hopefully Lauren's not also pitching a fit about something, right? But this inflection point, you know, we really don't know if we zoom out, right? So on this previous slide, we were nice, tightly zoomed in on this. But if we zoom out, the truth is we don't really know how big and far-reaching the consequences will be in the long term. And you've heard me talk in the past about how important perspective and control are as leaders as we face the future, right? We need to be able to give our people perspective and we need to give them a sense of control. And the truth is that when things are very close, they, they look big, right? And the more we zoom out, the more perspective we get on their actual size, and we will not know the actual size of this for some time to come. So the question becomes, 
what color will this end up being? What size will this end up being? And CLA and all futuring tools, right, are one way to make sense of this and to try to shape the future. So this inflection point called COVID-19 and its re related economic recession, the big idea here is it feels very close right now. It feels very big, scary, uncertain but we won't know the truth of this for quite some time. So the question for me then becomes, how can I help impact that future? How can I do that? So you heard me say at the top of the hour that if we want better futures, we need better stories. And here's the truth of this. I'm gonna leave this slide up here for just a second because it's a, it's a pivotal slide to this entire talk today. But um, what you may not know is that the way that you are wired up, the way your neurons wire, the way you make sense of the world, the way that you interpret people's questions of you through email, verbally, otherwise, is based on this idea that you are a storytelling animal. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that um, you are constantly creating a narrative. I'll give you a, a patented example. Have you and a loved one ever gotten in a fight, right? And then you've decided to go your separate ways for a while, maybe cool off and zen it out, right? And if you're like most people during that cool off period, what's often happening is you're just telling yourself a story. Why he or why she, she I know what she really meant by this. And you get yourself all spun up in a story, right? We all do this. Right? And then you come back the next day, maybe after a night of sleep or after a little time doing something else, you come back later and you realize uh, if, you, if you're having a nice, healthy conversation, like, what did you really mean? And what, here's what I meant. And I can see where that hurt you. And this is where that hurt me. Um, you can see how the story in your head may or may not match what was actually happening right? We do this all the time. We are storytelling animals. So the, st and the stories that we tell ourselves often create the futures that we live. So there are famous examples of Olympic athletes, right? And if what they visualize is getting to the Olympics, they often get there and they don't win. But Olympic athletes who visualize, who create compelling, multi-sensory images of what it is to win the Olympics, right? They often fare much better than those who simply visualize getting to the Olympics. I'm remembering some of the downhill skiing athletes. You saw them at the top of the hill, right? Um, practicing their routine. Um, you, you saw them literally going through every mogul and what that was, what that was going to look like. And they were visualizing. Why? Because we're storytelling creatures. We are storytelling animals. Um, this is why Hollywood and Bollywood are blockbuster industries. Um, and it's why many of us go to therapy, because we go to therapy to process the stories about our childhood, to process the stories about our, our closest in relationships. So if you accept the idea that we individually are storytelling animals, and we do this all the time, right? Uh, Brene Brown in her most recent Netflix uh, special, she uh, said that one of her key questions that she asks herself is, um, is this true or is this a story I'm telling myself? It's a very important question. Now, if you accept that we are storytelling animals, that we tend to make up stories all the time that may or may not be true, but just help us make sense of the wor world, then maybe you can also buy into the fact that together we create stories. Together we create stories. And if we've all bought in to a certain version of a story, we're gonna continue to live into that story. On the other hand, if we choose to change our story, well, then we've got to live into a different reality. So this brings me to causal layered analysis, right? The metaphor I want to share with you, many people use the iceberg model. I've heard the tree model. I've heard the cake model. 
But Dave and I designed um, this ocean model to explain causal layered analysis. So for those of you who have ever snorkeled, and especially for those of you who have ever scuba dived, and for those of you who love Jacques Cousteau and love A Thousand Leagues Under the Sea, um, some of this is gonna feel very familiar to you. But we're gonna use the metaphor of the ocean. So up in the upper level there of the ocean, you see, you see uh, a jellyfish, something that you kind of recognize. This is the sunlight zone, right? So in the sunlight zone, you can see what's underneath the surface. You can see the sand at the bottom. You can see any shells that are in the sand. You can see schools of fish, right? And it goes for a certain depth, depending on the conditions that day and so forth. But in that sunlight zone, things are pretty easy to see. And even easier if you put on a set of you know, goggles and a snorkel and you, you scoot around. You can see down for a certain number of feet, right? So that's the sunlight zone. That's, and these are the oceanic definitions of these, of these things. Then you get down deeper still, right, into the twilight zone. And this is the highly populated layer. Um, my honeymoon a few years ago, we went to the Galapagos and we did some scuba diving. And the currents were so strong and the water was so cold, but it created the perfect conditions for lots and lots of food. So no lie, from me to, to 20 feet away uh, in the ocean were um, humpback whales, right? And they were just there feeding. They were just feeding. And um, it was an amazing like level of the ocean because so much life, so many fish, it, the, the ocean was just teeming where these three big major currents came together and the Galapagos. And that, many people will say, this is what really makes the ocean tick, right? Because there's so much life, so much food there. Then you get to the midnight zone, like now you're starting to, now you're starting to get down there where it gets a lot more cold and there's a lot less visibility, right? So when we think of this deep open ocean, right, this is where some of the longest living animals live in this midnight zone, but there's a layer even deeper than that. And we don't get to see it very often, if ever, and it is the abyss, right? This is the, the coldest layer, the richest layer. Things move the, the most slowly because of the, of the cold. Um, <laughs> some of the weirdest creatures that you've ever seen are in the abyss. And um, it's really the, the bedrock, right? It's closer to where the tectonic plates are, where the big shifts can be made. And nearly no one, I mean, no one has gotten all the way down. They say, I think they say 11,000 miles deep is how far the deepest layer of the ocean goes. Um, 30 depths of the Grand Canyon. So we're talking cold, we're talking dark, we're talking not a lot changes, right? So think in these levels of the ocean. And now let's lay this over what we know as causal layered analysis. So here's how this comes together, right? So again, we can see our stories from clear at the top level, all the way to kind of lack of visibility absolutely at the bottom layer. Let's walk through each one of these. This is the guts of CLA and you'll see you'll see why it's a tool that uh, is incredibly helpful for rethinking systems. So at the top level of CLA is the problem. The founder of, CI, of CLA, Sohai Inayatua, the guy whose TEDx talk I recommended you preview, he calls this the litany layer, but that's a little too academic for my taste. So I just call it the problem layer, right? So this is where we've got data, um, we read headlines. If you are jacked up on your news feed right now, you are in this litany, this problem layer, just what's the news, what's the data, what's the news, what's the data? Beneath that though are the causes. Right? So all these problems are caused by something, right? These problems don't just manifest from the ether. There are systems in place. There are laws in place, right? One of the things that we, we talked about in, the, in one of the first weeks of the webinars, this webinar series, was the fact that we realize that our bureaucratic structures are not up for the rapid and agile deployment of PPE or whatnot during a pandemic, right? But these structures, these um, social contracts, these causes are there 
And they are the things that kind of hold the problems in place, if you will, or, or are causal um, to the problems. Then underneath that, this starts to get a little murkier, right? Underneath that, you start thinking about worldview. Worldview. So this is where you can start to say, all right, what are the paradigms? What are the mental models? What culture and values underlie those systemic causes? So as you can see, as we go deeper and deeper into the CLA model, problems are set in motion by causes. Causes are set in motion by worldview. And it is really common for people to never get beyond problems when they try to do problem solving, right? They try to solve for the data, but they don't maybe look a little bit deeper, right? And then even more rare is to get to worldview. But there's something even beneath that in this abyss, this thing that's hard to see and frankly can be even harder to talk about. The world of metaphor, in the world of myth. When you get right down to it, that is what drives worldview, which is what drives cause, which is what drives our litany or our problems. So I wanna give you an example. I wanna give you an example and I'm gonna take it up through, um, I'm gonna take it through the top. Sorry, I went a little too quickly there. Call me Trigger. Um, I wanna give you a case study and then we're gonna practice with something. All right, so I was working for a client in South Carolina and they were, they were complaining about brain drain. Like, Rebecca, we can't hang on to people. We don't know why we can't hang on to young talent. They come here, they live here for a year or so. We don't know why they're leaving. So, so to, the, to their mind, the problem statements were um, brain drain. Their problem statements were retention problems. Uh, some of their problem statements were things like young people these days, they just don't know how to, you know, stay with an employer for very long. They're disloyal, right? The problem statement. So I did some um, bar room research, which I enjoy doing in, in many clients' communities, and I just pulled up a stool at a local watering hole and just talked to people. You know, what's it like to live here and so forth. And you know what? One of the first questions I got was, where'd you go to school? You from here? Where'd you go to school? I was like, huh. And I answered my college. I said, I went to Drake University, Des Moines, Iowa. Have you heard it? And they didn't want to know what college I went to. They wanted to know what high school I went to. And I thought, this is unusual. I hadn't heard that question before. So I did some more investigating and found out that finding out what high school you went to gave you a place marker in that community. So either you were from there or you were not. You were either a comer, come from somewhere else, or you were a frommer, you were from there. So that's one of the things that that high school question did was sorted immediately who's with us and who's not. But the second thing that that high school question did was it uh, placed you within a socioeconomic status. So if you told me that you went to uh, West High School, it might mean that your family had a little more money. If you told me that you went to a school in the southern part of the city, it told me a different story. So I thought that was pretty interesting, huh? So come to find out that underlying some of these problems were this notion of strong levels of distrust for people who weren't from here. And in fact, when I would interview the people who had left this city, it's, why did you leave? Well, I never found my people. I never found my squad. I never felt like I really fit. It's like everybody was already in their cliques and it was hard to gain access to the cliques. Now, this is really interesting because this community also happens to have a reputation <laughs> for being terrific at hospitality. But you know, in hospitality, I came to realize people only come for a few days and then they leave right? They weren't people who were trying to stay and make a life in this community. So some of the causes, you know, that underlie this was, was this notion that I can't trust people whom I didn't go to school with, or I can't trust people who haven't lived here for a long time. And what was underneath that? Well, what was underneath that was their history through the Civil War, um, as you know kind of being told what to do 
you know, these are people who don't want to be told what to do by outsiders. So an example is if they were slaveholders, they wanted to be slaveholders and gull darn it, you should leave them alone. That was the truth. So they developed very strong, almost tribal ties and a very strong distaste for anybody from outside who might judge, who might have different ideas who might not be bought in generation after generation into the way that things were now what's underneath that what's underneath that is a very simple symbol i discovered that the semper fi that the marines use as their it's the coiled snake don't tread on me it actually had its roots in this community. That don't tread on me, don't tell me what to do. I will run my business my way. Thank you very much, please leave me alone. So, number one, you can see why at the top of the hour I said I do this analysis on every client, but I don't tell every client that I do this analysis because when you start to get into the worldview and the metaphor and myth, these are things that you know, are not comfortable for people to talk about. And sometimes they, it's invisible to them. It is possible that these, these metaphors, these myths are invisible even to them. And they're not something you wanna disclose in, uh, you know, in polite company. And yet, this is the work. This is the work. So to think about what's happening today with our economic recession, with our COVID recovery, right? And we are living in systems at that cause layer. We are living in systems that were invented by other people. We are living in a present that was invented by people hundreds of years ago. In many cases, these systems, right, that we are living in and among. And, um, you know, these systems may have been designed for a different time, may have been designed for a different kind of outcome that just doesn't reflect the way people are and live and work today. That is um, a very neutral statement to make, and I don't think anybody would disagree with that necessarily, right? I mean, I've, al I've always thought like voting, for example, voting on the first Tuesday in November every four years feels so outdated. I can apply for a mortgage online and I can't vote except at one polling place during one 20 hour period on one Tuesday in, uh, in one month every four years. You know, it's, it's amazing to think about how many of these systems far have outlived, um, you know, maybe their usefulness or their relevance, but yet, you know, we, we accept these things. So I'd like us to now practice, okay? We're gonna take a practice round. So, I'm going to give you a problem statement that we're currently experiencing, and then I'm going to break you in to small groups of about four people, and we're going to go through this bite by bite. So first, in your small group of four, you're going to talk about the systems or the causes that underlie the problem, right? Then you're going to come back. We're going to hash it out just a little bit. Then you're going to go back into your group, same group, and you're going to talk about the worldview that enables the, the system or the cause. And then you're going to come back, and then we're going to do one more short breakout and see if we can get to the level of myth and metaphor. Okay, so here's the problem statement. Right? The problem statement is that there's reporting from the CDC and others that COVID-19 deaths are disproportionately affecting people of color. So black people, Latinos, Latinx people, um, right? We, this is what is being reported in, mo in most major cities and now by the CDC. Okay, so I'm gonna put you in some small groups and I want you guys to brainstorm this second piece here. What are the causes of this? If you look at the systems, Right, what are the systems, what are the causes that get us to this problem? Okay. That's the question to hold for yourself. So I'm gonna stop my screen sharing. I'm gonna start our breakout groups. And again, the question is, what are the causes of this problem? Here we go. 
So just agree to join the breakout room and then talk about the causes. Here we go. subcategories under the broader rubric racism like micro stress etc um, environmental issues related to where black communities and latinx communities are located in terms yep. of near toxic places um, poor access to health and not being uh, believed in terms of health complaints all of those related things to uh, health create the disparities that you can see in the data Right on. Okay, that was a really good list. Stuart, I'm going to come to your group. Um, what did you guys have in terms of summary? Stuart's a professional listener. So um, what do you have, Stuart? Uh, so I'll echo Marquita and not duplicate um, what she said. Um, I also thought it was interesting that our group spoke about living conditions and how they showed up uh, for uh, people of color. And also an expression around working conditions, not least that uh, a couple of us are in the Midwest. And so meatpacking plants were top of mind for us, of course. Yes. And then one other really interesting point that surprised me, and I, I was pleased to hear it from Hart, he talked about um, access to information and the reliability or otherwise of that information. Um, we don't see many people of color on cable, for example, and that therefore how reliable um, is, is our faith in, in that information? Right on. I love it. Okay. Um, so this is, this is a good first start. Um, if, you, if your group did not get called on during this round, you know I'll be coming for you in the next round. So your group has thought now about some of the causes underlying the problem. Now we're going to get to worldview, right? So the question now becomes, what are the mental models, like literally the views of the world that people have that enable these causes, living conditions, um, you know, choices around um, jobs, micro stress, right? What are the worldview, the, you know, the mental models that, that cause these systems, okay? So we're gonna go back to the rooms, and this time I'm only gonna give you four minutes, four minutes. And I know there's one group that has six people, so I'm going to trust you to just manage your time well. Four minutes, here you go. Uh, may cause us to be dismissive of people that, you know, to go back to the problem, COVID has disproportionately affected. Um, we, we kind of segued into a talk about the people who have been sheltering at home and seem um, okay to do that perhaps longer and others who want this return to normal and let's crowd beaches and um and, and i'm from michigan and um you've probably seen our capital was stormed by people with uh um ak-47s and <clears throat> confederate flags and swastikas and <clears throat> and i think as our governor has said it wasn't a reflection on our 
our state, but certainly um, was disheartening. And we talked about, um, you know, is there a certain segment of our of our population that's more inclined to want it open? And is it those people who have an opportunity to not be as exposed as others? And so they want the normal, but it would be at some expense. Yes. Yes. Okay. This is a, f a fantastic way to kind of put a period on the end of this sentence. So I'm looking at the time and I think we're going to, I'm going to shepherd us through this last nine minutes together. So you are not going to return to your groups and talk about metaphor and myth, but let's talk about it together. So let me just share the slide here because um, I've been taking some notes as you guys have been talking so that you can kind of see the our shared um, kind of our shared meaning that we've been making together. So we talked about this problem of COVID-19 disproportionately affecting people of color and some of the causes of that. And I, I don't think I faithfully caught every word. I know I didn't, but some of those causes, right? And then what is the worldview that enables that, right? So the bootstrapper mentality with rights come responsibility, some of the things that you're seeing around reopen Michigan, right? So then you get into that, that abyss, that nearly black part of the ocean. It is almost um, invisible, especially maybe to those in power. You know, those in power, uh, when they first get into power, it's all new and then they become adjusted to it. And then they're like, I don't have that much power, right? Um, it becomes almost invisible to them. Um, but at the, in all of this, right, there is an undercurrent that those in power set the narrative and those in power kind of live into the narrative. Um, it's the whole reason why we had an American Revolutionary War, right? Those who were very loyal to Britain because they had it pretty good, the loyalists fought against the patriots who said there should be a different way, right? So in this abyss is metaphor and myth. And as you think about what could be the symbolism underneath this worldview, or what could be um, the emotional triggers, right? The emotional responses that underscore that worldview. Um, if you're comfortable, let's put some of those ideas in the chat. So the question is, um, what are the metaphors and myths? It could be visual images, it could be archetypes, it could be emotional triggers that enabled this worldview that we've just discussed. All right, so um, at the bottom of your screen, there's a little chat box. Um, or it, actually, it may have moved. Now that I'm sharing my screen, the chat box may have moved, um, but I'd be interested in seeing your ideas, if you're comfortable um, sharing uh, the metaphors and myths. My campers should have a head start on this because we talked about something very similar to this at camp um, around, around uh, causal layered analysis. All right, so um, thank you, Katie. Uh, yes, the historic myth of an economic justification for subjugation and slavery. Okay, close, close, but I'm gonna push you. That's too wordy. If I really pushed you, like what is the trigger word that allows that? because that's a historical truth, but what is the trigger word that allows something like that? Jonathan says that the symbol is masks, right? And what does that mean, right? It means different things for different people, right? So um, in Austin, Texas, wearing a mask uh, might call up images of cowboys and horseback in the Wild West. But if you're an African American and you're wearing a mask, you're being very careful about the kind of mask you're choosing um, so that it doesn't make you uh, feel more threatening to, uh, to, to white people, right? Um, oh, Darren Hill says, I can't see your screen. Did I not do that properly? It's possible. I mean, once again, it's absolutely possible. Um, so here, here is my screen. Let me make this bigger. Darren, give me a, give me a text if you can see it now. Um, so, <laughs> I am, some days you're the bug and some days you're the windshield. Um, all good now. Okay, let's hope it stays that way. So again, we're running through the problem, the causes, the worldview. And now the question is about metaphor and myth. Um, uh, here, Dan says, here's a, here's a symbol, one world. So the Together at Home logo and event provided an excellent mental model for a hopeful future, that we are all global citizens in this together. Um, that is an, actually an excellent example of flipping 
the myth and the worldview and hopefully driving at a different outcome. Um, Linda Timmons says authority, that could be the word. And yeah, because what's underneath the word authority is the idea that there is an author and there are folks to whom that author, or that authority or that authorship is subjugated, right? Uh, white privilege, thank you, Katie. Bob Horton says bias, um, could be bias. Um, separation, Joanne Martins is talking about separation. These are excellent examples. And what they all get to, from my perspective, is this, is this myth that um, I think separateness probably comes closest to it, but it's, it's even more than that. Not only are we separate, but there's better and there's worse. There's better and there's worse. And um, if that is kind of the, the mental myth, if that is the, the organizing principle that our country has been founded on, then you can start to see, can't you, a couple of things. You can start to see how we are separated from our environment. You know, in the founding document from Johnstown 1606, the very first charter in a community, they said that they were settling this land um, as part of their godly um, duties, right? But God had about four words in this multi-hundred word document. Most of the language in our, in our country's first community charter was about that man had dominion over the air and the water and the sea. It was man over nature, right? So that there's a duality in that. It's man over nature. So what happens then if we, in that case, shift the, the myth to humankind with nature, not against, but with. We did this very exercise at camp using a different problem. And uh, we've done it for several years at Futures Camp. But um, one year, we had um, a man named Eric at camp, and he was a representative from the Ho-Chunk Nation. So Ho-Chunk here in uh, Wisconsin and in Minnesota, uh, they are people of the big voice because the Ho-Chunk people were seen as um, having kind of a direct ear uh, to the gods, to the goddesses, and with their big voice, they would kind of share what, what they had heard. So Ho-Chunk, people of the big voice. And um, as many of you may know, the Ho-Chunk Nation and other nations also are um, split into clans. So if you're in the Bear Clan, you're responsible for one responsibility. Uh, within the nation. If you're a deer clan, you're another responsibility within the nation. And Eric was part of the clan that was responsible for protecting the nation. So, um, you know, they were constantly thinking about what the threats would be and so forth. So it's interesting because at the, at the systems level, at that cause level, there were some systems that we could all recognize. But the Ho-Chunk's nation, the Ho-Chunk nation's guiding myth is oneness kind of what Dan was just talking about, is the idea that um, these fish in this ocean are our brothers and sisters. They're not separated from us. They're, we're one with them. And that we are one family with nature, with the trees, with the grass, with the fish, with the birds, with the deer, and so forth. And if that's the defining myth, right, then you can see how throughout history, um, different choices are made, right? and different um, worldviews get created and they have different outcomes. Different outcomes that in some ways, uh, because they have absolutely collided with the governing myths of a different culture, um, haven't necessarily been favorable. You know, from a First Nations perspective, the idea of selling your land is ridiculous because land can't be owned. Land just is, it belongs to all of us, right? So, but that, if that is your opening myth that land can't be bought or sold and it bumps up against someone else's myth that the land is meant to be dominated and, and um, used and cultivated, um, then you can see where cultural clash occurs. So I'm gonna stop my screen share. Um, happy to send these slides out. Everybody who's registered, I've got um, your email, but let me just close with this challenge to you. If we want better futures, we definitely need better stories. And those better stories should come from ideally a different worldview. 
but boy, if we can get to a different myth. So as you are thinking about the future of your community, the future of your organization, how you're gonna come back better than before, be thoughtful about the story you tell yourself. And if you don't like the story that your organization is telling itself currently, or the story that your community is telling yourself currently, this crisis, this ink drop on this piece of paper is the moment. It is the moment to tell a different story. So with that, I'm gonna end the recording. I'll hang out if anybody wants to um, ask some questions, but we promised an hour and I've already gone 120 seconds over. Sorry, I love you guys. Take care, take care of each other and stay safe.